thanks for the invitation to be here. So, let's try and get my slides up. Okay, these are a list of my disclosures. I do a number of trials, for, largely around novel therapies, both for diabetes and dyslipidemia. So, um, I've been asked to set the scene, really talk about the global burden of diabetes. I look through the other talks, and hopefully there won't be much overlap, and, and where there is, I'll hope it will just reinforce key points. Um, for, my, for my sins, and actually I work in primary care public health, I'm, I'm in the department of PCPH at Imperial, and one of my interests is particularly around implementation research, and we've got a number of opportunities to potentially do that. Um, I'm also deputy, I'm the clinical director of the Digital Innovation Hub at Imperial. So this is kind of the, the model that we had years ago for diabetes. So this is typically, as you know, a individual with type 1 diabetes, and one of the biggest discoveries, most important discoveries, was the, the role of insulin and being able to manufacture insulin. So that when you basically replace insulin, you, um, you basically normalize life expectancy in these individuals that would have otherwise died. But unfortunately, at that time, we've seen this sort of change, or rather from that particular time, that was sort of 60, 70 years ago, uh, we've seen this evolution in diabetes. And so we recognize that there is another contribution, and that is the role of insulin resistance. So this is an individual who is insulin sensitive, and no guesses there, there is somebody who is insulin resistant. So the, the, the whole interaction that we, we see during your life course is around the genetic vulnerability. And in GWAS studies, there are a number of genes that have been identified that contribute towards the pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes. But there is also this environmental influence. And your genes aren't necessarily your destiny. And perhaps with some of these individuals very early on, with things like public health policy, particularly around obesity in childhood, and in the early adult, and, and in certainly in early adulthood, those are individuals who perhaps small changes being maintained for the next 40 or 50 years might end up preventing them developing diabetes age 50, 60, and so forth. So if you look uh, at the proportion of cases that are attributable to type 1 and type 2 diabetes, then it's roughly about 80, 20, or 90, 10. And they can be basically broken down into type 1 and type 2. And the pathophysiology is very different. The type 1s are earlier onset. It's absolute insulin deficiency, autoimmune basis in many cases, whereas type 2 much more has this environmental uh, relationship. So, so that, that's one of the key differences. And one of the biggest problems, and it doesn't matter whether it's hypertension, dyslipidemia, et cetera, is that in general, Unless you've got really quite high blood glucose levels or you're losing weight or you've got some other symptoms, that modest elevations in glucose levels really don't cause much in the way of symptoms. So you've got this lag period between where somebody, if you like, has preclinical disease and the time that they present. And there's a lot of work that's been done talking about you know, uh, screening and whether it's cost effective or not. And I think the argument really is one around cost. If costs come down, then it makes sense perhaps to think about some form of screening program. So this is uh, a slide from a, a paper a couple of years ago in the New England Journal looking at North Americans and looking at basically, if you look at the, the age range, this is basically before the age of 20. And these are the different ethnic groups. And so if you basically look at type 1 diabetes, where there is a huge genetic component to this, whereas with type 2 diabetes, there is much more of an environmental exposure, what really strikes you is that in this 10-year cycle, the, the increase or the incidence per 100,000 youths in certain ethnic subgroups, and we know there are huge disparities in health-related to socioeconomic deprivation, cost of living, and this is obviously a US model, but if you probably looked at this in a number of other parts of the world, you'd see a similar trend. 
So again, that is telling you something about actually the environmental factors, because it would be very unlikely if this was just a genetic basis that you're going to see this massive uh, change. So if you look in terms of absolute number of cases, and then you've basically got a, uh, a percentage of the US population here living with diabetes, and again, largely driven by this epidemic of obesity, sedentary lifestyles, we see absolute numbers increasing, and the proportion of people living with diabetes increasing. And one of the problems with this is because people now survive longer, because we can, we can offer various treatments to reduce some of the complications, et cetera, of diabetes, the population pool is gradually going to increase. So if it was type one diabetes and you didn't have insulin, people would largely die out with that particular condition. But because we can obviously improve health and make people live longer, the prevalent pool of diabetes is going to increase uh, really uh, quite considerably. So prevention is important, but then actually treating the consequences. So if you like looking at some basic stats, so it's one of the most common non-communicable diseases, fourth leading cause of death in most developed countries. There's about 194 million people with this, and that's going to increase. And a lot of that increase is going to be regions of the world that can least afford it. And because the same proportion in, for example, if you looked at India and China, a small percentage change in those countries is going to have a huge increase in the absolute numbers of individuals living with this condition. And this is really what I was referring to. So from the point at which you diagnose diabetes and then you've got the life course of this condition, the appearance of, of complications, long before that, there are a number of things that maybe give you some clues to whether an individual is likely. So obesity is probably, obesity and a family history are probably the biggest predictors of that, sedentary lifestyle. And then when you start to get various blood tests and things done, often we do a lot more of these opportunistically. And there may be signs, for example, a low HDL cholesterol or a high triglyceride is often a, a fairly good marker of insulin resistance developing in somebody uh, who goes on to develop diabetes later on. So what are the complications? And unlike a lot of other things, so if you looked at, for example, LDL cholesterol, unlike LDL cholesterol, so for, um, diabetes will be linked to both macrovascular disease complications, so, and I'll show you some slides about this, so fatal and non-fatal MIs, fatal and non-fatal strokes, but more importantly, and this is much more linked to glucose levels, microvascular complications such as retinopathy, it's the leading cause of blindness in the world, nephropathy, accounting for about half the causes of end-stage renal disease, and it's probably the commonest cause of dialysis, and neuropathy, um, about 60 to 70% of patients have some manifestations of uh, nervous system damage. So this was some work that one of my PhD students did a few years ago, and it's the largest analysis of all of the pooled cohorts, so roughly about half a million people with and without diabetes. And this is really why preventing diabetes is so important. Once somebody has it, then preventing complications becomes important. But you'll see that if you develop diabetes, and this is a population level approach rather than an individual approach. So if you look at people with diabetes, and you get diagnosed by the age of 40, on average, that cohort is going to lose half a decade of life. And half of those deaths are going to be from cardiovascular causes. Now, we always think about diabetes as being this high-risk condition, but what this also shows you, that basically if you diagnose it aged 80, 90, your aims might be somewhat different because actually if you're looking at life years to gain, so here somebody, intervening here, you've got many more life years to gain. You're losing half a decade and you can gain those back. At the age of 80, 90, even though the relative risk might be high, you have very few life years to try and claw back. And it's a bit like, you know, when you look at cancer therapies and gaining a few months. Now, as the pro proportion of people or the prevalence of diabetes increases, this is the attributable faction because it's such a if you like, a malignant condition in terms of macro and microvascular disease complications, 
The population attributable fraction of things like major cardiovascular events and deaths attributable to diabetes is just going to increase. So as many as about one fifth if uh, diabetes prevalence increased to about 40%. And to give you an idea, if you go to the Middle East, it's about 35% prevalence in that part of the world. So what does diabetes do in terms of cardiovascular disease? Well, it exactly doubles. Look at the number of cases. These aren't individuals. These are cases. These are fatal and non-fatal MIs. It exactly doubles your risk of coronary heart disease. Most of those are going to be linked to coronary death. So the first event is often a fatal one. Non-fatal uh, myocardial infarction increased by about 80%. And diabetes increases the risk of ischemic strokes, hemorrhagic strokes, interesting, by also 56%. Only blood pressure really does that. And also deaths from other vascular causes, so heart failure deaths, pulmonary embolism, et cetera. So diabetes is not really about the sugar. It's about vascular disease and the microvascular complications. I'll walk you through this. This is what epidemiologists like me call a mediation analysis. So I showed you in the previous slide, diabetes doubles the risk of, of cardiovascular disease. And when you take into account risk factors that we think cluster with diabetes, blood pressures, uh, abnormal lipids, if all of that risk goes away, then you can probably attribute some of that excess risk to that condition. So if you did that for coronary heart disease or strokes, it doesn't go away. And you might say, well, maybe it's the blood glucose, but if you actually adjusted for blood glucose and you took that into account, it only attenuates by about 20 or 30%. So it's not being driven by the glucose. And let me walk you through that in a bit more detail. These are people not known to have diabetes at baseline, but what we've done is collected a blood sample and we can break them down into these groups. Now, if basically I've got an individual who has diabetes and you think that his risk or her risk is entirely driven by blood glucose levels, then surely by controlling blood glucose better, I would attenuate, not only attenuate that risk, but maybe even abolish it because it's all to do with that. And that's not the case. And Miles and others are going to talk to you about trials and this disconnect between glucose levels and importantly, and drugs that actually reduce cardiovascular risk and complications. So that's an important key take home message. The person with diabetes and established vascular disease, this is somebody here, a slightly different data set, a smaller data set, um, but still several hundred thousand people. If you've got diabetes and you've already had a cardiovascular event, you now don't lose half a decade of life, but you're going to lose a decade and a half of life if you're aged 40. And to claw back those 10 years, you're gonna to have to be a lot more aggressive about medical treatment and interventions. So again, another really good uh, New England Journal paper looking at outcomes. This is type one diabetes on the left, type two diabetes on the right, deaths, deaths from cardiovascular disease, deaths from coronary heart disease and hospitalizations. And you can see that over time, as we implement treatments, that actually there is a reduction in all of these type of events over time, because we're getting better at finding treatments, we're getting better at implementing them. But there's always been a gap between those with and without diabetes. So actually preventing people developing diabetes in the first place <coughs> becomes really important, because if it was just about these treatments and getting them in to the patient population, you might actually attenuate this difference to the null, and we haven't seen that yet. So that's got various implications. And this is really why you need a multifactorial approach. Lifestyle, it's in every single guideline, but we know it's difficult to maintain, often at the point at which you start to see the patient, and you've got to do this for a long time. Others are going to talk about glycemic control, and I'll just show you a couple of slides on this. And I've put a question mark about platelet inhibition. I think there's a talk on that later on this afternoon. So lipid lowering. For every, these are, this is a meta-analysis of the statin trials broken down by people with and without diabetes. So a lot of people um, probably won't look at data in this way. And what this basically shows you that it actually really doesn't matter how you lower LDL cholesterol. These are different trials of, with different statins. If you standardize all of them for a one millimole reduction in LDL cholesterol, 
And you can do this. You know, you can have this consultation with your patients. Whatever their baseline risk is, for every one millimole reduction, you are going to reduce their risk by about one-fifth. So the higher their absolute risk, the higher the absolute benefit is going to be. But you are going to reduce their risk for every one unit by about one-fifth. And because it's a straight line, the more you reduce it, the better. What about blood pressure? This is, again, a meta-analysis with a range of different endpoints here. And you can see that a 10 millimetre of mercury reduction in blood pressure, irrespective of, of the mechanism for mortality, for cardiovascular disease, for CHD, fatal and non-fatal MI, strokes, um, and actually some of the microvascular outcomes as well, they're all improved. And what you'll see is that there's a much stronger relationship with stroke than there is from coronary heart disease. That's exactly what you see in other studies. Blood pressure much more strongly related to strokes than coronary artery events. So because these are individuals at high risk of all of these, that small reduction even maintained for a long period of time has a huge impact. I'll walk you through this. Another New England Journal paper by Roshani. And you'll know in your guidelines, and, and I can't remember whether you've still got the quaff points necessarily for uh, various lipid targets, etc. I think many of those have been changed. But what this basically does is it shows you the relationship between a number of risk factors that are either uncontrolled or controlled. So if all risk factors were controlled, basically in every age category, and there are four different outcomes, so mortality, uh, myocardial infarction, I'll show you a couple of other outcomes. At every given age, your risk is lower. Now, as you go down, what you see basically is this nice relationship between uh, the number of risk factors that are not controlled and adverse outcomes. And what you find, for example, is that particularly at younger ages, the more that you have uncontrolled, the higher your relative risk. So actually, what it means is that also in, we know that there are potential benefits, but also side effects from treatment. So if you see somebody aged uh, 80 with risk factor control, you might, or, or abnormal risk factor control, you, you might actually, in that individual, if you are trying to balance side effects of medications and benefit, be a little bit more lax, but in young, younger patients who are likely to be able to tolerate these medications, it becomes much, much more critical. Because if you don't, what you're going to get is the legacy of adverse exposures and outcomes, which are going to be very hard to claw back. And the same relationship here for strokes and the same relationship for heart failure. Again, it has a much bigger impact when you look at younger people. The more of these factors you control, the better your cardiovascular outcomes. And one of the biggest problems that we need to focus on is really this whole thing about obesity. Others are talking about this, so I'm not going to go into it in huge amounts of detail. But basically, your uh, fatty tissue are a harbinger, well, they're, they're a, a warehouse for a number of processes that lead to inflammation and abnormal function of your vascular wall lining, which in part also contributes towards this excess risk. You don't need to remember this, but essentially one of the issues we have is that people with diabetes often have activated platelets that are a bit more sticky, so even when we control other risk factors, that there is this excess prothrombotic risk. Now, um, you might say, well, in that case, it makes perfect sense to think about aspirin or other antiplatelet agents. The bad news is, and this is a meta-analysis that we did, and I'll walk you through this. Basically, these are the number. These aren't just people with diabetes, so it's risk. In a primary prevention setting, these are the number of events you avoid, and these are the number of bleeds you cause. So there's really never a level of risk whereby the benefits of giving aspirin routinely in a primary prevention setting are offset by the, or well, the benefits in terms of CVD events prevented are off, are, um, uh, you, you've got this net benefit against bleeds, for example. So, uh, and the Oxford group last year last year, I think, conducted this large study with diabetes in the primary prevention setting. And basically, it's this concept of net benefits. The only thing that they, they really showed was largely driven by TIA uh, reductions, this reduction in overall cardiovascular events. But 
essentially an excess risk of bleeding. And if you actually change and you look at different levels of risk, so five-year risk of 5%, 10%, 15%, 20%, and you look at the number of bleeds caused by the number of cardiovascular events prevented, at a population level, it's largely equal. And one of the problems is the things that drive your cardiovascular event risk also increase your risk of bleeding. And this is, for completion, this is the whole of the world data in primary prevention for all cause mortality uh, with aspirin. So this is why largely it's not in any of the guidelines uh, other than one in North America based on one particular study that was done years ago looking at non-fatal MIs and strokes. So in conclusion, basically, diabetes doubles your risk of cardiovascular disease. The prevalence is increasing. It's not explained by conventional risk factors, so actually preventing it really becomes way more important because we've not found a way of normalizing that risk. The interventions that are proven, your first treatment should be to think about blood pressure lowering and cholesterol lowering. And uh, maybe we can take a bit more of that in the Q&As. And the, uh, the other thing is that, particularly for younger patients, you've got to think about more intensive treatment. They'll largely tolerate treatments better, and you've got many more life years to gain. So I'm going to stop there.